Take a Bible, if you would, please. Uh, there is a Bible in the pew, uh, either in front of you, or if you're sitting on the front row here, just reach around behind you and grab a Bible. Uh, there should be one in the pew there where the next to the hymn book is. Uh, or you can go to, um, you can pull your phone or tablet out, go to Blue Letter Bible. And uh, I think it just automatically goes to the King James Version. That's the one we use here. And I want you to follow along with me in the Word of God. Because I, I want you to get and grasp what's going to happen this morning. And understand, you know, people have different ideas about how you go to heaven. And even different churches would have different ideas about how you go to heaven. Now the Bible tells us, and you can say this is narrow-minded, but I didn't write the Bible, I just believed the Bible. So the one who wrote the Bible, we believe, was God. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so that's how the Bible was received. It was God speaking to men like Ezekiel, Isaiah, John, Moses, was one of the writers, of the, he, wrote, he wrote the first five books of the Bible. And how did, you have to ask, how did Moses write about his own death? How did Moses write about the creation when he wasn't there? The Holy Ghost showed him what to write and he wrote it down. So those words in your Bible, they're accused by a world today of being the words of men. I assure you, once you start reading them, you will find out very quickly, they're not the words of men, they are the words of God. Somebody say amen. Stephen Jenny was telling me this morning that some quack on CNN. They were talking about Governor. Qu I was going to say something else, but anyway, the gov of New York and the trouble he's in, and some idiot on CNN says, "Well, you know the the, the Bible says Jesus admitted he wasn't perfect." Now I'm going. What verse is that? I don't think I remember reading that one in Sunday school. So we believe that this Bible is right in everything that it says. These are the words of life. When, when uh, everybody in John chapter 6, when everybody was turning and leaving Christ, because they didn't like what he was preaching. He looked at Peter and said, Peter, would thou also leave me as well? Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So what I hope to convey to you this morning is hopefully the words that bring you eternal life. The way to heaven. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. If you would turn there, I'd like to put the verses on the screen. Um, I've been doing that for the last several years. Uh, that helps me keep my message in order. I, I just All I have in front of me is scripture. I don't have a bunch of other notes of things I want to say. I just have scripture, 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 scripture. The first place we're going to go to is 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, I'd rather be called a son of God than a son of Satan or a child of the devil. Wouldn't you? Somebody say amen. amen. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, verse 2. Beloved, now, right now, if you are born again, and God has saved you. You have asked God. God saved me. God forgive me of my sins. Don't ever let me depart from your word. And God when I die. I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. He says beloved now are we the sons of God. We are the sons of God right now. However it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Because Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15. That the... The resurrection body that we're going to get doesn't look like the body that we have now. Thank you, God. And he used the illustration of a seed. When you put a corn seed or a bean or a mustard seed in the ground, radish seed, onion seed, even bananas, yes, they have seeds. When you put that seed in the ground... What comes out of the ground does not look anything like what you put in the ground. That's the illustration that he gives us. That our new bodies, 
thank God, are not like these old bodies. These old bodies break down easy, they tear up easy, and they do foolish and stupid things very easily. So he says, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we shall, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm baptizing five people today in the hope that when they die, that they immediately stand before God. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. That when they stand before God, and God, because there is a record in heaven of every wrong thing you've done. Do you believe that? Well, it's just about as sure as there's a record in the NSA website you visited last week. Is that one easy to believe? And every text message you sent. And every picture you took. And every place you went, there's a record of it somewhere. The Bible tells us that God has a record of the things that you've done that violated God's law. Though That's what we call sin. Sin is a violation, transgression of God's law. And when you stand before God, you're going to be held accountable. What's wrong with my microphone now? It's on. What is it? Making a noise? Is that better? All right. But there's a record of everything that you've done up in heaven. And those charges are awaiting you when you die. The only thing that eliminates those charges is the washing away by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he has blotted out our transgressions from his book so that when they open the book of the things that you've sinned against God that book is opened and they will not find any sin laid to your charge because you have been forgiven of every sin that you ever committed somebody say amen that's the promise that we have that's what Christians Bible, born, born again, Bible-believing Christians have waiting for them on the other side. And while we're here, we must live in hope that God will perform and do what God said He would do. That He would keep His promise to us. That if we confessed our sins, He would be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says. That God would be willing to do that. But let me ask you a question. Does it scare you to die? Hang on a second. David talked about the terrors of death. That compassed him. We see people who have died of, who died in severe pain. They have a grimace stuck on their mouth when they die. It's just stuck there. You can tell they divide, they died in severe pain. They died in agony. Or if someone dies in terror, like somebody has a heart attack. And there is a few seconds where they recognize they're going to die. There is a fear that overcomes them that they cannot, they cannot alter. They cannot stop. My right shoulder today is killing me. It's going to rain, isn't it? And that right shoulder is a result of, in 2006, I was electrocuted for about a full minute and I realized that more than likely I was going to die of electrocution. And let me tell you something. I was afraid. I was afraid. Because I knew I was going to stand before God in judgment. And all the things that I had ever preached throughout my life, I would have to have wanted them 
to be present at that moment when I drew my last breath in this world. And as I was about ready to pass out, I said, God, I don't want to leave my wife and kids. And God, the electricity just let go just like that. And God saved me from that day. I'm not dead yet. But I can tell you that there are times when I don't look forward to dying. There are times when I do look forward to dying. There are times I don't look forward to dying. Dying is a scary thing. God put it in us to want to preserve our own life. Did he not? So while yes, I guess in some ways you can say I'm not afraid to die. Or I'm not afraid to go to heaven. But I think... In all of us, there is a fear that when our death is pending and it's imminent and we can feel it, I think a terror creeps into us. You understand what I'm saying now? Now take your Bibles to Exodus 14. In a few moments, I'm going to take five people with the aid of Brother John here. And we're going to pass them through the water. Now, there's nothing special in that water other than it's about, I'd say, probably 88, 90 degrees. It's nice and warm. Okay? In fact, that you hear the water kick on now, it's because enough water has evaporated since yesterday that it's, it's filling up. It's adding to it a little bit more. We have a nice baptistry heater in there. But there's nothing special about that water. That's City of Festus. That that somehow, some way, drew out of the Mississippi River more than likely and cleaned it up a little bit, and there it is. Okay, that's all there is to it. That water does not save anybody. You say, then why are we doing it? Because it shows on the outside what has already been accomplished on the inside. I like to say that it shows both the past, the present, and the future. Number one, in baptism, we do show Christ's death because Christ died for our transgressions. Three days later, was risen again from the dead. And that's why we take them down into the water. It shows death. Bring them up out of the water. It shows new life again. And that was Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And when you're baptized, that's what you're saying you believe. Whether CNN believes it or not. Amen. We believe it. Amen? Amen. But then it also shows the present situation of that person's life. That person has decided, you know what? I'm tired of walking for the devil. I'm tired of living in sin. I'm tired of spending my, my life and wasting it the way I'm doing. The sin is killing me. It's having its effect on my on my body, on my mind, on my marriage, on my relationships, on my work. I can't keep living like this. And I can't help myself. I must turn myself over to God. So it shows the present of a person who is willing to die to the old self and be raised up again. And now I'm ready to walk a brand new life. If anybody has ever desired a second chance at life, God is the one who can give it. Amen. But then it shows the future. What we believe is going to happen. Because just as I heard the news last night that our dear sister Bonnie, whom we love. Bonnie's such a sweet lady. Sweet lady to this church. Her body is just covered from head to toe with cancer. And her body's going to give out in probably just a few days. But you know what Bonnie did a long time ago? She came to Jesus and she said, God save me, forgive me my sins. Bonnie's a sweet lady. I couldn't think of anything she's ever done wrong. Roy might have a different opinion. But she realized she needed a savior. You know what she did years ago? She asked Jesus in her heart to save her. Do you know why? It's because this day that's coming shortly for her. That's why she asked Jesus into her heart then. When do you buy life insurance? Before you die or after the guy dies? Before. 
Why? Because there's one thing that's absolutely certain is going to happen to everybody in this room and everybody listening to me right now is they're going to put your body in a casket one of these days and close the lid on it. And if you're not ready to stand before God in judgment. And let me tell you something else too that you may or may not know. Don't just trust me on this one. When you find yourself standing before God... Don't say, God, what about all my good deeds? Don't they outweigh my bad ones? You know what God said in Ezekiel 33? In the day that a righteous man sinneth, all of his righteousnesses are gone away, are taken away from him. So if you think that you have righteous deeds up in God's scale waiting for you, outweighing your bad deeds, God took them off years ago. And your works of righteousness are as filthy rags in God's sight, God said. Now, Exodus 14, let me show you an illustration of baptism. Peter brought this out, and Paul did too. Paul said that the baptism of Moses was when they went through the Red Sea. Moses leading, you saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, right? Or you've read this story where Moses led the Israelites through the Red Sea. Well, it's a picture of baptism. And let's read this story. Exodus 14, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. Uh, uh, saying, Speak uh, unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon. Before it ye shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that they shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And so it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, meaning Israelites. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot, his people with him. He took over 600 chosen chariots. Now you have to understand, the Israelites have been in bondage to slavery for 400 years. They didn't have any chariots. They didn't have any swords. They didn't have any spears. They didn't have any weapons. All they had on them was the ability to run. Here, against the Red Sea, God led Israelite to a trap, but He wasn't trying to entrap. Throwing his army. I want to think about what's what's killing you. What's killing, what's killing your happiness and joy in life? What's killing your marriage? What is it destroying your relationship with your husband or your wife? What is it that's weakening you? What is it that's destroying your reputation at the job you do? What is it that may have already gotten you fired from several places and you can't find another job? What is it that is destroying you right now? It's called sin. Pharaoh and his army is sin. Chasing you. Death. Chasing you. But it's chasing you into a place that God says, I want you to be with me forever and forever in the promised land that I will give you. The trap here was on Pharaoh. And so what happened was, if you look in verse 7, he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. How many chariots did Pharaoh take with him? All of them. When Christ died, 
How many sins did he take of yours and nail them to his cross? All of them. Everybody say that with me. All of them. Amen. So that you now will not be held accountable for anything that you've done. That's what grace is. Grace is when people that I loved found out things about me that were wrong and they loved me anyway. That's grace. Grace is when you do something wrong to your wife or to your husband and they turn around and they say, Honey, I forgive you. I love you. It's undeserved. But that's what grace is. Amen. So verse 8, And the Lord hardened the heart of the Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. The children of Israel went out with a high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, all of them, and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon. So I want you to get this picture. We're going to look in verse 10. Here we have the Israelites, and they're at the, they're at the, the beach of the Red Sea camped because there's no other place to go they've gone through a mountain pass and they're at the beach of the red sea but they can go no farther because of the sea they don't have boats they don't have skis they don't have floats everett told me the other day he was learning how to swim without swim floaties he's so proud of himself they didn't have anything like that they were going to drown in the red sea then they found out that Pharaoh's army was coming to kill every one of them. So in verse 10, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were so afraid. That's what I was getting at a while ago. I said, when I said, are you afraid to die? Because if, if somebody came in this church this morning and this happens, if some nut came in this church this morning with two AR-15s pointing them at everybody in this church, would you be afraid? So don't tell me you're not afraid to die. Because if somebody came in this church like that and started shooting, every one of us would be afraid. There is a natural fear of death in every one of us. For those who are lost and are not saved, the fear that you have of death is not of death itself. It is a deep-seated knowing in the inner being of your soul that you will stand before God in judgment. Though your rational mind tries to rationalize that out and say, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in judgment, I don't believe I did anything wrong enough to deserve hell, I don't even believe in hell, though your rational mind might try to rationalize that out, there is something deep in your soul that is telling you, you're, you're going to get it standing before God. It's not going to turn out well for you. They were so afraid and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. So what do you do when you're afraid of dying? Cry out unto the Lord. And so in verse, tell you what, let's, let's move down. Verse 13. Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the, see the what? Salvation of the Lord. Which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. What if I told you that God could get a peace and put it in your heart that you would never ever be afraid of dying and going to hell the rest of your life? Would you accept it? Amen, sister. Would you not? And it, that it was absolutely free. That offering we took was not a payment, a partial payment for your sins. It had nothing to do with that. If 
God offers salvation to you. He offers it to you free of charge. Or he's not the God that loves you. And he said, and he said, the Egyptians, remember the Egyptians are your sin. He said, you're going to see them no more after today. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And who fought for us 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, taking on the sins of the entire world? Who did that for us? Jesus Christ. So that when we die, we are as innocent and sinless as Christ is. That's the promise. So in verse 15, the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, you, if you, you just have a hard time with this. This actually happened. And I'm, I can tell you this. The chariot wheels have been found at the bottom of the Red Sea. They're there. This, by, this is not a fairy tale. This is not a fable. This is not a myth. This is not a story that Jesus made up to scare kids. This is a real... And if you don't believe that, just ask um, Charlton Heston. <laughs> right? I think that's the best one. That I think he made the best movie. Amen. Now look what he said. Lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. The children. See, here's what, here's what parts us. We're here down on earth. Where's God? Well, he's not on the moon. He's not on the sun. He's not on Mars. He's not on the next star over. He is way over on earth. The other side of the universe that we can't even see with our space telescopes. That's where God is. So let me ask you a question. How do you think that you're going to go to heaven on your own? When you don't even know how to get there. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 24 is going to do? He's going to sound the trumpet. He's going to send his angels to gather us all together and take us to heaven with him. Because the angels know the way there. We don't. So if you think that you're going to go to heaven on your own and you're going to be able to do it without Jesus Christ. You can't even tell us where heaven is. So how do you think you're going to go there? God divided the Red Sea, verse 17, Behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, which I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Yeah, the Egyptians shall know it. As the waves are crashing down upon them, they're going to go, Uh-oh! We were wrong. Verse 19. The angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went before, from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp and the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud of, and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. Again, if you don't believe the Bible, this story is impossible to you. But I believe and live for and serve an impossible God. A God that does miracles. A God that can take water from a sea and part it asunder. And allow his people not to walk through muddy water, but to walk on dry ground. So that they marched across from one side to the other side. And let me tell you what's on the other side. I'm, boy, it's, i got to hurry. Turn to Revelation 21. Let me tell you what's on the other side. By the way, if you saw the Charlton Heston movie, Ten Commandments, a lot of that was right. Every one of Pharaoh's army 
was destroyed after the Israelites made it to the other side, God pulled the waves back in and destroyed and killed Pharaoh and every one of his army. Because God said, you're not going to see them today ever again. They're not going to chase you ever again. Brother George, those sins are not going to touch you ever again. This is what's on the other side. Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away. And look at this. There was no more sea. Isn't that something? What was it keeping us from God? The sea. The Red Sea. What's keeping us from the promised land? The Red Sea. God says, I'm going to take it away. No more division between God and us anymore. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God, listen to this, shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And don't tell me you don't shed tears. If you don't shed tears, I think there's something arrogantly wrong with you. When your eyes leak, it means your head won't swell. Amen? But I have a feeling that when Sister Bonnie dies, we're going to cry. We'll shed tears for her. Roy will. You pray for him. We've buried several people out of this church. We've shed a lot of tears. Because it hurts when they leave us and we can't have them with us anymore, doesn't it? It hurts. And God promises that on the other side, He's going to wipe all tears from our eyes. And then He said, There shall be no more death. I've buried my grandparents, buried my dad, buried a granddaughter. I don't know who in my family I'm going to have to bury next, but I'm not looking forward to it. On the other side, God has taken away death. So that we don't have to lose anybody that we love ever again. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more. Who's in pain right now? Whose body's hurting right now? Raise your hand. Now, I'm going to ask this question too. You don't have to raise your hand because this might be just private with you. Who's hurting in their soul, in their mind. Some of you raising your hands. That's a worse pain, isn't it? God's going to take that away. See, I sat across the table for six weeks from people who took meth, heroin, opiates and every one of them had a trigger for why they did what they did and it was pain with some of them it was physical pain with others it was emotional pain pain from their childhood pain from their problems as an adult but everybody has pain, don't they? And on the other side, God's going to take all that away. Wouldn't that be worth living for God the rest of your life? Somebody say amen. amen. For the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Yes, Heaven has a new car smell every day. 
And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. God doesn't lie. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be as God. And he shall be my son. That's the verse we started out with, wasn't it? That yes, right now, Robert, you are already a son of God. Even without this. But what this does is that it's going to show the world, I'm not the old Robert, is he, Trish? You can say it, it's okay. He's not the old Robert, is he? And Trish ain't the old Trish, is she? Thank God for that! And I'm not the old Mike. Because when God works, He makes all things new amen. amen that's what's waiting on the other side now here's what I want John where are you wake up <laughs> I want you to take these people take them downstairs and have them start getting ready while I preach the rest of this okay Derek Go, go down there with John, all right? Amen. Man, there goes half the church. Now look, in, look at the next chapter in your Bible, Revelation 22. Let's read the first five verses of that. Revelation 22, verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Have you ever drank pure spring water? Right out of the, I mean right out of the spring. Ice cold. Sweet, sweet as sugar because all those minerals that are in it. Go down to Hot Springs, Arkansas and they've got places down there you can fill up all the jugs you want for free. Of all, because they got so much spring water coming up out of the ground out there. Cold spring, they got cold springs and hot springs right next to each other. You go down there and bring up, and you can get all the water you want down there, absolutely free. It's in a city park. Doesn't cost a dime, and I'm telling you, it is the when you drink it right out of the right out of the spring, best water I've ever had in my life. This water is better than that. Let me ask you this morning: Are you thirsty? See, if you're not thirsty, everything I'm saying to you just doesn't matter to you. You're blowing it off. You don't want to hear it. And you're not going to listen to it. But I promise you, just like me and everybody else sitting here, we got thirsty one day. And there was nothing to drink. And then we went to Jesus and got the water of life. Verse 2, he said, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree, there was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, Kevin, I was reading that last night. And I always had this question of, if we're in heaven, and we have new bodies, and we have eternal life, why then do we need a tree whose leaves are for the healing of the nations when up in heaven there's no disease and there's no sickness and there's no death. You follow what I'm saying? Why do we need this tree up in heaven? Well, then it, I read it again and it dawned on me. Look at what it said. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's a past tense. Everything in this book right here in Revelation 22 is present or future tense. This is what's going to happen. Do you know what this tree was? Is... That book. Right here are the leaves of the tree of life. And they are right now for the healing 
of all of us nations. You know what the word nations here means? Ethnic groups. Because God doesn't just save black people. You thought I was going to save white people, didn't you? I know racist. God don't just save black people. He saves them red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. Right here in this book is the tree of life. Amen. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And His servants shall serve Him. And they shall... See his face. Now that's something that up until this time has been prohibited. No, Jesus said no man has seen God at any time. Nobody has. Because Moses wanted to see God. Remember that on Mount Sinai? God told him, Moses, you'll die. I'm going to pass before you and I'm going to let you see my back parts and that's it. Just seeing the back of God caused Moses' face to shine so bright when he came down from Mount Sinai that the people couldn't stand to see his face. They said, put a veil over his face because he's been with God. He, he shines so bright, we can't, we can't stand it. But one of these days, in a glorified new body, God will allow us to see his face for the first time ever. And I think it will take us an eternity to get over it. Amen? His servants shall serve and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there should be no night there. Night, let me tell you about nighttime for me sometimes. For me, nighttime is times I can't sleep. Nighttime for me sometimes is nights of pain. Nighttime for me sometimes is nights of emotional distress. Thoughts upon my bed haunting me. Scaring me, depressing me. One of these days, God's going to take away the darkness and the night. And I'm not going to be scared anymore. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Right now, we cannot fathom a place or an existence that's not governed by time. But in that place, time will be no longer. There will be no time. We will live as brand new people forever and ever and ever. Now, here in a minute, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to tend to this baptism. But right now, I want everybody... To bow your heads for me, if you would, please. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to notify me. I'm not going to ask you to embarrass yourself in any way, shape, or form. What I am going to ask you is, is that if you don't know Jesus Christ to be your Savior, if you've not called upon the name of the Lord. If you haven't shown to the world that you're ready to live as a Christian. No longer living the way that you used to live. Today is the day of salvation for you. If, if you'll receive it. The Bible says, harden not your hearts as in the day of the provocation. For today and now is the day of salvation. And if you're here this morning and you would like to ask Jesus to save you, to cleanse you, wash away your sins, wipe them, blot them out of the books that are written of the sins that you've committed. You can do so right where you are. By just saying, God, save me. I cannot change myself. And I don't want to live 
this sinful life anymore. I can't do it anymore. God, will you save me? And God, I'm afraid that if I do this, then I'll just go right back to the old ways. So God, if you save me, God, I want you to change me too. And God will do that. Father, we come before you today. We ask your blessings now upon these that are praying. And Lord, whoever, Father, you've reached down to, whatever heart, Lord, that you're working with and dealing with, I pray, dear God, that the heart would turn soft. And God, that you'd be able to work in them and move in them. Show them, dear God, that there's everlasting torture for those who shun your free offer of salvation, but everlasting joy for those who accept it. So, Father, we ask your blessings upon those, Father, who call upon the name of the Lord. God, that you would both save them and forgive them and give them everlasting life so that when they cross that sea, they can receive for themselves what's on the other side. Bless this word today, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.